man who was Monday. Kirk Baker knew he was sick when he woke late in the day. He saw the sun sinking in the west and got up close to got up close to the blinds. Somehow everything seemed wrong. He hurried to turn on his antique lamps. Ah, he breathed out with relief. For a moment he forgot his sick feelings and the joy of his anchor to King treasures. His large apartment was full of them, all ancient, all beautiful. He glanced around the living room. He put in his smoking jacket. It's full of small, delicate bronzes, Chinese portrait trousselings, further sitting room with jam with rare early American antiques, pewter chairs, pressed glass. It was after coffee that he decided to call his old friend Ralph Leverman. Ralph could be something with his uneasy, chaotic head. Gave him some quieting prescription. He's more and more aware of it now. Beneath him that floor gently rocked, no doubt, he thought. The disturbance was merely digestive. Something he'd eaten didn't agree with him. On the way to the phone, Ralph, he stepped inside the study for a glimpse. The ancient Japanese lamp he purchased just yesterday. It was gone. With a queer feeling of uncertainty, reality, Kurt Beckner sat down suddenly on choice, old oriental ottoman. Lamp had been there in the room, he knew. He seemed to remember. Had been stoned a fond glance at it just before retiring last night. But it wasn't anywhere in the apartment. Thieves must have taken it, he thought so anxiously, going from the window to window. When he realised his surety, this is a physician. The apartment was on the tenth floor. The window leading to the fire escape was doubly locked. The front door was bolted, as always, from the inside. And yet the lamp had gone. Suddenly, Benkner thought he was going mad. He stared at the locked sound at the door. When he opened it, it, trem- it, it trembling, Ralph Rutherford Rutherford stood there. Ralph, Ralph, Benkner stuck, breathed in relief. I'm going to call you and ask you to come over. How wonderful for you to drop in. I'm not feeling well. Ralph Letterman came in, stared at him anxiously. What do you mean, Kurt? he asked. I, I didn't come to visit. I came because you... You did call me this morning. You said you were sick, and Beckner stared at him disbelievingly. Weakly, he dropped into in, uh, and to a genuine Chipperdale chair. Ralph, he began hoarsely. I didn't call you this morning. I got to bed late and rose only a moment, a while ago. But you did call me, Leverman, Leverman insisted. At seven o'clock, you complained I'm not feeling well. So I said, I'll come after hospital hours. Ralph, I didn't call. I swear I didn't, Rutherman put down his bag, felt the other's pulse. There's nothing wrong with your physically, Kurt. I swear that. But your mind, Kurt. I've spoken to you about this before. You know that. You weighed an arm around the apartment. You cut yourself off in the real life. Living like this, living with only this old junk. Old junk, Beckner quavered indignantly. Precious antiques, you mean, Ralph. Lovely, love, wonderful old things. Why? They might be they my very life, precisely the man said. They're too much of your life. Old things can be dangerous, Kurt, as well as precious. They can make things happen to a man's mind, lead him to forget the real world, work him terribly harm. harm. What? What nonsense, Beckner said, smiling feebly. No nonsense, Kurt, the man said seriously. The eternal compilation of the past can obliterate the present and hinge mind's ability to function in the present. He broke off anxiously and then continued. Something already has happened, Kurt. You forgot you phoned me this morning. Beckner shuddered as a, as a chill fear went through him. Something indeed was wrong. For an instant he was tempted to tell his... friend about the missing lamp, but Lufferman might make too much of that. Instead of something really being wrong, something he didn't want to know about, 
will frighten him. I'm just suffering from an upset start, Ralph, he declared weakly. It's something worse, Kurt, I'm sure of it, Lefterman said. Come now, promise me you give up this feverish search for antiques, the things of the past. Get out and live in the present for a year. At least, if you don't, I can't answer for the consequences. I can't, Buckner said desperately. I live only for my treasures, Ralph. I may you as well be dead without them. The other man looked at him helplessly. Then he wrote out a brief prescription. Very well cut, but remember, I warned you. If your illness really is due to your stomach, the prescription will help you. Should help you. His words deepened, saddened. Voice deepened, saddened. Goodbye, Kurt. His friend was gone. Kurt Beckner sat trembling, trying to throw off the feeling of uneasiness, a growing malaise. Ever stronger now, his mind felt pulled this way and that, as though he had been ripped from the old courses, as though he had somehow lost direction. He glanced at the prescription, blinked. His heart stopped pounding. Suddenly pounding. Then the doorbell rang as the door, at the door a man stood, holding a small package, the rare destined china piece you ordered this morning, Mr. Banker. Then, then I, I sailed, the man said. Dresden, China? I ordered it? Banker's face ceased. In fright of bewilderment. I never seen you before. The man had produced a paper. Here's the invoice you signed. Well, they're called, he said. I promised to deliver the piece late this afternoon. Now it's your signature, isn't it? Beckner glanced at the signature. His head welled. It was his. But he couldn't remember signing it. Or did he? Flashes of memory seemed to have gone and come and gone. Perhaps he did know the man. Perhaps not. Couldn't fix the face exactly in his mind. Then almost an impact of sharp sudden blow, the phrase of memory snapped from a deadly fundamentality. Dizzy took the passage and dismissed the man. His old city fell back into a comfortable old chair. For hours he sat frightened to his marrow, trying to reason things out, foiling. He felt more and more nauseous. His head was bursting with a sense of unrushing acceleration into nowhere. Then the phone rang after the what seemed eons of time is Mr. Tanoi from a Japanese importing firm. Banker seemed to recall that name. What about what? he asked. Did Mr. Tanoi want the old house lamp you ordered, Mr. Banker? Mr. Tanoi said, arrived in Japan just an hour ago. We'll live it any time you say. Lots of hideously silent chaos crashed for Kurt Bangler's mind. He knew he already brought the, the, the lamp. He remembered. I thought he did, talking to Mr. Foyer about it. Now the lamp was gone. Yet, according to Toye, the lamp had never left the warehouse since his arrival. Then his eyes dropped to the prescription with voluntary. Sought something there. Clawed almost. The invoice read what he dreaded. It could, it would, it could mean only one thing. He knew one horrible fact that met, that must, if true, very foundations the world from beneath his feet, confirmed Ralph Lohmann's fear for his mind, but even more terribly. What's, what, what day is today, Mr. Tonoy? Baker said. Why, it's Monday, Mr. Baker. Monday the 17th. Mr. Tonoy said. A phone slipped suddenly from Baker's nervous hands. It was true. A thing he feared. He knew it wasn't Monday. It was Wednesday. A nervous glance at Canada, his old cabin desk, showed a page reading Wednesday in the 19th. Now he knew what had happened to him. He knew what horrible fact could account for lamps being gone and missing, for he remembering fretfully some things forgetting others. Tony said it was Monday, a date of a loan for men's prescription. On the invoice was Tuesday. Bankley knew he'd gone to bed late on Wednesday morning. And when he awakened, it was Tuesday again. Mind the body, Banker. Banker knew that began living backward at every certain rate, pulling fast and faster past because of the session with it. Labour man had come on Tuesday. Already, only an hour late, later, it was Monday. Back was coming, he was going. Forgetting everything in his confusion, destined to lose his treasures. One by one, his life rushed past the time he brought them. Soon he would become a mere ghostly memory. A world he knew only that he vanished would flee among, away from him. Forward in time, 
he went irresistibly backward.